many of you in this audience in the first circle of friends and relatives and acquaintances uh, have undergone divorce? May I have a show of hands, please? Uh, and how many of you in your second circle of friends and acquaintances have heard about or undergone divorces? So I think the numbers that I hear clearly indicate, as has been stated, the rising numbers of divorces that we see in our today's society. The question that arises is that why is it that the numbers are soaring? Is it that the people have lost the art of adjusting, of tolerance, of companionship, which is the essence of it? Or are there other any factors that are responsible for that? If you see the statistics, though it does not sound very alarming if you compare it with the Western world, that out of 1,000 marriages, one ends up in divorce is what the story was earlier. And today, the numbers have gone up to 13. So this increase in the number of divorces has led all of us as lawyers, as sociologists, as social thinkers to wonder what are the causes. Uh, have you ever wondered as to why those I mean, I'm sure there are many of them in this audience who were married in 70s and 80s. Their marriages lasted, as they say, till death do us apart. Is it that they never had a problem? Or is it that they adjusted? Why is it that today we find so many number of cases uh, where people are intolerant and unable to do so? I think this is a time for us all to reflect on what can be done to prevent this. I believe that any good family lawyer who deals with these cases has to deal with it in a very sensitive and with a kid glove because these issues deal with the emotions of the people concerned, it's the husband, wife, children, etc., etc. And the first attempt that every good lawyer should make is to ensure that these issues, if they can be settled in an amiable and an amicable manner, preferably by bringing the parties together, or in extreme cases where it's just not possible to part gracefully. In my view, and strangely you would find it, as a lawyer, I do advocate that litigation should be the last resort in such cases. I remember, I think a few couple of years back, a couple who took an appointment and they came to me, and once they started saying hello, and they said, they started with cases like, uh, what do you think, ma'am, are the reasons for the number of divorces that are going up? Why is it that the young people have become so intolerant? Why is it that people are unable to adjust? Is it the social, social factor? Is it their individual things? Please tell us all these questions. I mean, I was just taken aback with so many questions coming in one breath. And I just did inquire with them, I mean, is this some kind of an media interview? So they just looked at each other, they smiled. Then they looked at me, then they smiled. And they said, no. We are in love. We intend to get married in a few months from now. And we thought that we should take an opinion of a person like you who's dealt in some, such several cases as to what could be the, the warning bells, what could be the pitfalls, what are the things that we should be aware of, as they say, the do's and the don'ts, to ensure, because we are in love and we do want to have a long-lasting relationship. So we had this conversation for some time and um, in my view, they were pretty satisfied with what we spoke and they went back. Now that made me think that what is it that makes these young people have these thoughts in their mind before getting married? Is it a sense of insecurity in their mind? Is it a fear of the unknown? Is it the number of cases that they see around in families and friends in social circles? Or is it the statistics? What is it that makes them, though honestly, I must confess, I was truly impressed by the maturity that the couple showed and the way they sort of, you know, addressed all these questions without even batting an eyelid, wanting to learn from me and wanting to absorb from me what could be the causes and what could be the warning bells. So I would now like to say a few of them, of course, the list is not exhaustive, but a few of these things, if tackled at the right time, could probably help parties overcome their issues and we could prevent and have a lower rate of divorce. The first and foremost, <clears throat> in my view, is communication. 
Communication is the key to the relationship. We find couples after some time, they just stonewall themselves and become so difficult for either the spouse or any people around them to understand what is happening. Lack of communication leads to a lot of misunderstandings. Lack of communication leads to a lot of uh, sort of, you know, apprehensions and fears in the mind. So in my view, communication is a must. It may not necessarily be a very happy communication or a very positive one. Even if it is not, not communicating is surely not an answer. Sometimes if it's difficult to have discussions, sometimes if it's difficult to have analysis of what's happening, no couple should resist from taking help of therapists and the counselors who will help them to tide over these nervousness and the issues and sort of have some dialogue. The next question, the next pointer which I would like to say is in such situations that people or the couples who are in a relationship should mention is that they should have work-life balance. I'm sure you've heard about this everywhere. Now why is it work-life balance so important in a relationship? Today we see young couples, they are so driven, career driven, they are goal oriented, they want to do well in their career and of course at the workplace there are so many stresses and strains and deadlines etc etc with all these issues that come up there's very little time to spend with the spouse there's very little time to just understand what's happening even on a daily regular basis so in my view a dedicated spouse time is a must if there has to be a, a conversation if there has to be Knowing what's happening in your life, what's happening in my life, the good, the bad, the ugly. Because unless that is done, there will be very little bonding between the couple which is there. The third is expectations. To have realistic expectations in a marriage. Because at the end of the day, as they say, after love, the marriage is the reality. And when that reality hits you hard, that's where couples find it difficult to adjust. Uh, in my uh, experience, I have seen that a few of my clients who came to me, uh, the reason for them was because they strayed in the relationship. I remember one of the clients coming to me and saying that I do need to confess, ma'am, that uh, I have strayed in my relationship. But trust me, I have no intention of cheating on my husband. How does this go? At the same time, I did realize after we spoke that there was a lot of emotional vacuum in their relationship because there was no bonding, there was no conversation, there was no relationship which was there. She also confessed to me that the reason why she strayed was because she finds a lot of comfort in the other person in whom she was with the relationship. Very often, I'm asked this question. In my view as a lawyer, is it that the extramarital relationship is the cause for the number of divorces or the breakdown of marriage? Or if there is a breakdown of marriage, is that the reason why there are extramarital affairs? In my view, both the propositions are true. Because there are different circumstances and the propositions are true. Increasingly, I have noticed that there's a lot of emotional infidelity. There may be cases where there is physical infidelity, but what is a damaging effect in my view as a lawyer to a relationship is the emotional infidelity and the involvement that takes place. And that is why this emotional vacuum has to be taken care of at its initial stages, as they say, nip it in the bud, so that it does not grow into a monster. Lastly, what is the edifice, what is the basis on which a marriage can last long? Most of us would say love, most of us would say a lot of things. But in my view, as a lawyer, and which is by the number of cases that I've led, is the respect and the trust. If there is respect and trust in the relationship, then there is a, there is a strong possibility that such marriages can last. Now, I'll tell you a very interesting case that I did. 
a couple of years back, a, a husband came to me, he took my appointment, he came, he was in a very agitated state of mind, and he said, ma'am, do you know what has happened? My wife has commit, committed adultery, she's in a relationship with some other person, I am so angry, I want to destroy her, I want to destroy the man. And I just first had to calm him down. I said, I understand, I understand, this is not easy to take, but this is not the way to react. Whatever was required to be done legally, uh, we got it done, we filed a case, we were in court for a year, year, and you know how it typically happens in courts, all allegations, accusations, etc. went on. On one fine afternoon, while my client and me were waiting in the corridor of the court for the matter to be called out, the wife and her lawyer were standing there. They approached me and they said, ma'am, is it possible for us to meet and to talk and try and find a solution? This is getting very ugly. I said, surely, and I lapped it up. We had a couple of meetings with the lawyers, that is me and her lawyer, the husband and the wife. Little, the ice was broken, they were not talking to each other. I noticed that my client was a little more calmer, not as angry, not as bitter, not so full of vengeance as he was earlier. And I lapped it up and I took up that opportunity. After several meetings, I told them, now, no longer lawyers, now you all meet as husband and wife and try and sort it out. I'm so happy and proud to share with this August gathering that today the family is together, the husband and wife are together, and the children are on cloud nine because they have now got both their parents under the same roof in a very peaceful environment. So as a lawyer, I believe that the willpower of the couple to tide over all difficulties. And here I would like to take, tell you the parable which I explained to that couple was in the Bible. There was, a, there was a mob which was lynching a woman who had committed adultery. That's when Jesus Christ walked in and he told the crowd, that one person, man or a woman, who has never committed a sin in his life should be the first one to throw the stone at the lady. And not surprisingly, rightly so, not one stone was flung at that lady. I think that explains it all, that there's no black, there's no white, and it really takes determination, it, it, it really takes a lot of effort, it really takes a lot of courage to accept the wrong that we do, I do, and the, accept the wrong that the other person does, because there's nothing greater than life than being together till death do us apart.